All right, welcome everybody. I am going to attempt to read the summary of final rule 2021R-05F on the ATF website, atf.gov. Whoops. I don't know where I have this open. Was that it? Okay, I think I got rid of it. Sorry about that. I had uh, another window open. So this is on atf.gov forward slash rules dash and dash regulations forward slash definition dash frame dash or dash receiver slash summary. So again, that's atf.gov slash rules dash reg and dash regulations slash definition dash frame dash or dash receiver slash summary. Believe it or not, that's actually a pretty simple URL for this thing. All right, so definition of frame or receiver and identification of firearms. The page on the website is about two pages printed, and it links to an, a PDF document that is 364 pages. I'll read this first paragraph from the website, and then I'm going to start to read the, the PDF. So on the re website, it starts off with the first paragraph on April 11th, 2022, which is today, still nine o'clock for me on April 11th. The Attorney General signed ATF final rule definition of frame or, or receiver and identification of firearms amending ATF's regulations by removing and replacing the regulatory definitions of firearm frame or receiver and firearm or frame or receiver using examples and diagrams to clearly convey what is a frame or receiver, amending the definitions of firearm and gunsmith, providing definitions of terms such as complete weapon, complete muffler, or silencer device, privately made firearm, and readily, not or, and amending regulations on marking and record keeping. The following is a summary of the final rule, but not intended to be relied on when complying with the requirements of the final rule. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six bullet, I think up six bullet points. Uh, then there's some other definitions. Uh, it's basically a bunch of definitions uh, with many bullet points on the website here. I'm not going to read all that. I'm going to jump over to the PDF. I'm going to open it up full screen and then go automatic zoom to page width, which makes it pretty large. I think everybody can read it on the screen. I'm going to bring the comments up since I'm doing this live on YouTube. I'll be posting this on multiple platforms, so feel free to leave some comments while you're live here or um, in the future, wherever you happen to be watching this. However, I'm not going to offer any uh, commentary and I'm not going to read the comments so much. I'll just kind of pay attention to maybe highlight a couple of them as I'm reading here. But my goal is to attempt to read the 340 something pages of this new ruling for people who are you know, just for whatever reasons want to hear it as opposed to read it. Uh, and I think I can do a better job as a human than a text reader or some kind of, well, some kind of automatic reading system. All right, so it's going to start, I'm reading now the 364 page PDF. Starts off with, please note that this is the text of the final rule as signed by the Attorney General, but the official version of the final rule will be as it is published by the Federal Register. Billing Code 4410 FYP. Department of Justice, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, 27 CFR Parts 447, 478, and 479. Docket number 
2021R-05F, AG Order Number 5374-2022, RIN 1140-A54, Definition of Frame or Receiver and Identification of Firearms, Agency, Bureau of Alcohol, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Department of Justice. Action, final rule. Summary, the Department of Justice, we're going to call it the Department, is amending Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, or the ATF, regulations to remove and replace the regulatory definitions of firearm frame, firearm frame, what is going on? Frame or receiver, the cut, Come on, what are you doing to me? My thing's being weird to me. The regulatory definitions of firearm frame or receiver and frame or receiver because the current regulations failure to fail to capture the full meaning of those terms. The department is also amending ATF's definitions of firearm and gunsmith to clarify the meaning of those terms and to provide definitions of terms such as complete weapon, complete muffler or silencer device, multi-piece frame or receiver, privately made firearm, and readily. For purposes of clarity, given advancements in firearms technology. Further, the department is amending ATF's regulations on making and record keeping that are necessary to implement these new or amended definitions. Date, this rule is effective. Insert date that is 120 days from the date of publication in the Federal Register. So we already know now that the date is effective 120 days from the placing in the Federal Register. And we know that this is the text of the final rule as signed by the Attorney General, but not the final rule that will be, will be published in the Federal Register. So this will take effect 120 days after it's placed in the Federal Register. All right, I'm going to stop commenting if I can help it. Page two, for further information, contact Vivian Chu, Office of Regulatory Affairs, Enforcement Programs and Services, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, U.S. Department of Justice, 99 New York Avenue, Northeast Washington, D.C., 20. 226-202-648-7070 is our phone number. Supplementary information has a couple of parts. The first part is executive summary, which will have the summary of regulatory action and the summary of costs and benefits. Try not to comment. Uh, next up is section two, background, which has three points that ATF's application of the definitions to split frames and receivers, B, privately made firearms, and C, advance notice of proposed rulemaking on identification markings placed on firearms, silencers, and firearms mufflers. The third section will be notice of proposed rulemaking with a whole bunch of different sections. The first one is definition of a firearm, then definition of a frame or receiver, definition of readily, definitions of complete weapon and complete muffler or silencer device, definition of privately made firearm, and the definition of the importer or manufacturer serial number. Finally, the definition of, oh no, finally, definition of gunsmith, marking reg requirements for firearms, and finally, record keeping. This, that's the second page. Oh, no, it's not finally. And then also record retention, because they couldn't put J in the middle. Oh, I'm going to try not to comment. Sorry. F four, an analysis of comments and department responses for the proposed rule. There's two sections here, issues raised in support of the rule and issues raised in opposition of the rule. So there's analysis of the comments. And then the final rule, the definition of firearm, definition of frame or receiver, definition of readily, definitions of complete weapon and muffler and silencer device, definitions of privately made firearm, definition of importer or manufacturer serial number, 
definitions of gunsmith, marking requirements for firearms, record keeping, record retention, effect on prior ATF rulings and procedures, severability, statute, then there's another section, section six, statutory and executive order review. There's multiple sections here, um, executive orders, 12, or 12866 and 13563, executive order 13132, executive order 12988, I guess I should be saying D, Regulatory Flexibility Act, E is the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement and Fairness Act of 1996, F would be the Congressional Review Act. G is the Unfunded Mandates Reform in 1995. Ugh. H is the Paperwork Reduction Act in 1995. Ugh. Executive Summary is Section I. That has some sections. Starts off with A, Summary of the Regulatory Action. There are no statutory definitions of the term frame or receiver in the Gun Control Act of 1968 or the National Firearms Act of 1934, the NFA. To, to, to implement these statutes, the terms firearm frame or receiver and firearm or and frame or receiver were defined in regulations to mean that part of the firearm which provides housing for the hammer, bolt, or breech lock, and firing mechanism, which is usually threaded at its forward portion to receive the barrel. Um, from I'm not going to start reading all of these codes that these are referencing, but that's referencing a code in the Gun Control Act, Title I and Two. These definitions were meant to provide direction as to which portion of the weapon is the frame or receiver for purposes of licensing, serialization, and record keeping, thereby ensuring that a component necessary for the functioning of the weapon could be traced if later involved in a crime. However, a restrictive application of these definitions would not describe the frame or receiver of most firearms currently in circulation in the United States. Most modern weapon designs, including semi-automatic rifles and pistols with detachable magazines, have a split or multi-piece receiver where the relevant fire control components are housed by more than one part of the weapon. The upper receiver, page four, and lower receiver of an AR-15 rifle. Or incorporate a striker to fire the weapon rather than a hammer. In the past few years, some courts have treated the regulatory definition of firearm or receiver as inflexible when applied to the lower portion of the AR-15 type rifle, one of the most popular firearms in the United States. If broadly followed, that result could mean that as many as 90% of all firearms with split receivers or striker fired in the United States would not have any frame or receiver subject to regulation. Furthermore, technological advances have also made it easier for companies to sell firearms parts kits, standalone frames or receiver parts, and easy to complete frames or receivers to unlicensed persons without maintaining any records or conducting a background check. These parts kits, standalone frame or part receiver parts, or partially completed frames or receivers enable individuals to make firearms quickly and easily. Such privately made firearms, PMFs, when made for personal use are not required by the GCA to have a serial number placed on the frame or receiver, making it difficult for law enforcement to determine where, by whom, or when they were manufactured and to whom they were sold or otherwise transferred. Because of the difficulty with tracing illegally sold or distributed PMFs, these firearms are also... Commonly referred to as ghost guns. Trying so hard not to comment. For these many reasons, ATF is... Come on. Prog... Prom... What the heck? A rule that would bring clarity. Yeah. This word would bring clarity to the, I'm trying not to comment. They used a word I've never, I'm 
50 plus years old, I've never seen this word before, uh, would bring clarity to the definition of a frame or receiver by providing an updated, more comprehensive definition. On May 21, 2021, the department published a notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register proposing to redefine the term frame or receiver as that which provides housing or structure to hold or integrate one or more of the fire control components. In light of the comments received, this final rule revises the proposed definition of frame or receiver so that the frame is applicable to a handgun and variants thereof and a receiver ugh, is applicable to a rifle, shotgun, or projectile weapon other than a handgun or variants thereof. Moreover, frame or receiver will be defined to describe only a single part that provides a housing or structure for one specific primary fire control component of weapons ugh, that expel a projectile or one specific primary internal sound reduction component of firearms, mufflers, or silencers. The final rule also defines the meaning of variance and variance thereof. The final rule provides detailed examples along with pictures, eh, identifying the frame or receiver of a variety of common models under the updated definition. The final rule also exempts from the new definitions and marking requirements existing split frame or receiver design in which a part was previously classified by the ATF as the firearm frame or receiver and provides examples and pictures of select exempted frames or receivers such as the AR-15 M16 variants. The only exception to grandfathering will be for partially complete disassembled or non-functional frames or receivers, including weapon or frame receiver parts kits that ATF did not classify as a frame as a firearm frame or receiver as defined prior to this rule. The only exception to I'm gonna read that sentence again. The only exception to grandfathering will be partially complete disassembled or non-functional frames or receivers, including weapon or frame or receiver parts kits that ATF did not classify as a... I'm trying hard not to comment. I'm trying hard not to comment. The final rule also specifies with more clarity and examples than the... Uh, NPRM, NPRM, what is that? Uh, oh, notice of proposed rulemaking. So, uh, where did I go? Sorry, trying not to, I just didn't know what that was. So, the final rule also specifies with more clarity and examples than the comment period, how these terms apply to multiple piece frames or receivers. Those, an example, those that may be disassembled into multiple modular subparts. Firearms, mufflers, and silencers to partially complete disassembled or non-functional frames or receivers, including frames or receiver parts kits and to frames or receivers that are destroyed. Ugh. The final rule also provides detailed examples of when such items are considered readily completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to function as a frame or receiver. At the same time, the final rule makes clear that articles that have not yet reached a stage of manufacture where they are clearly identifiable as an unfinished component of a frame or receiver Example, unformed blocks of metal, liquid polymers, or other raw materials <laughs> are not frames or receivers. <laughs> I'm trying not to comment. It cons consistent with the Gun Control Act and to ensure proper licensing, marketing, record-keeping, and background checks with respect to certain weapons, 
parts kits. The final rule adopts the proposed clarification of the term firearm to include weapon. <laughs> Example, pistol, revolver, shotgun, parts kits that are designed to or may readily be complete, completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. Okay. Uh, this rule also finalizes with minor changes the proposed definition of privately made firearm. It amends the regulations to require that all firearms privately manufactured or made by non-licensees without identifying marks that are taken into inventory by licensees be identified or marked and recorded so that they may be traced by law enforcement through their records if they are later involved in a crime. As with the NPRM, the national something that was the comment period, the final rule does not mandate, wait a minute, is that the comment period? does not mandate the unlicensed persons to mark their own PMFs for personal use or when they occasionally acquire them for a personal collection or sell or transfer them from a personal collection to an unlicensed in-state resident consistent with federal, state, and local law. In addition, the rule finalizes the proposed amendments to the term gunsmith to include persons who engage in the business of identifying firearms for non-licensees, thus ensuring greater access to professional marking services <laughs> for PMFs. The final rule clarifies the gunsmithing rules proposed by the comment period by stating the following. One, licensed dealers, in addition to the latest licensed manufacturers and importers, may conduct same-day adjustments of repairs of all firearms, including personally made firearms, without taking them into inventory, <laughs> provided they are returned from, to the person from whom they were received. Two, like non-licensees may mark personally made firearms for a licensee under the licensee's direct supervision. Um, and licensees may adopt an existing unique identification number previously placed on the PM uh, on a person on the gun by a non licensee under certain conditions. In response to comments, the final rule permits licensed manufacturers to adopt the serial number and other identifying marks previously placed on a firearm without a variance from the ATF, <laughs> provided the firearm has not been sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of to a person who is not a licensed manufacturer superseding ATF ruling 2905-2009-5. The rule permits licensed manufacturers to perform gunsmithing services on existing marked firearm, existing marked firearm, firearms without marking or obtaining a marking marking variance superseding ruling 2010-10. It also finalizes with some modifications the proposed definitions of the term importers or manufacturer serial number to help ensure that the serial number and associated identifying markings required to be placed on a firearm, including those to be placed on a personally made firearm or an ATF issued serial number are considered the importers or manufacturers serial number protected by, eight, by the NFA, which prohibits possession or receipt of a firearm that has had the importer or manufacturer serial number removed, obliterated or altered. The final rule adopts with minor clarifying changes the proposed clarifications to the marking and record keeping requirements for licensees. First, the rule finalizes the definition for complete weapon and complete muffler or silencer device. We're on page eight, by the way, and adds a new definition for multi piece frame or receiver. Under the new definition, frame or receiver, the rule also the new rule wait the rule also specifies a reasonable time period in which the 
a complete weapon or complete muffler or silencer device or the frame or the receiver of a weapon or device, including a modular subpart of a multi-piece firearm or receiver, must be marked with a serial number and other identifying information and recorded. Second, the rule finalizes the proposed updates to the information required to be marked on the frame or receiver, clarifies the meaning of the marking terms identify, legibly, and conspicuously, oh my God. and authorizes firearms licensees to adopt identifying markings in the, in the manufacturing process. Third, this rule finalizes the proposal to require all licensees to consolidate their records of manu requires that all licensees consolidate their records of manufacture, acquisition, and disposition of firearms, and to el eliminate duplicate record, record keeping entries. Huh. Fourth, with respect to parts defined as firearms mufflers or silencers which are difficult to mark and record. This rule finalizes with minor clarifying changes to proposed amendments that allow for them to be transferred between licensees qualified under the NFA for purposes of further manufacturer repair of complete devices without immediately marking and registering them in the, <laughs> in the transfers book. So, oh my gosh, I'm trying not to comment. The fifth, the rule finalizes with minor clarifying changes the proposed amendments that set forth the process by which persons may voluntarily seek a determination from the ATF on whether an item or kit they wish to manufacture or possess is, in, is a firearm or armor-piercing ammunition subject to marking. Oh. Oh. And, oh my God and other applicable federal laws and regulations. These amendments to the regulations will help ensure that firearms can be traced efficiently and effectively by law enforcement through the records of licensees and help prevent the acquisition of easy to complete firearms by prohibited persons and terrorists. That's what I'm worried about. All right, I'm, we're on page 10. Lastly, this is 364 pages. I'm going to go insane. I'm not going to be able to do this. Lastly, the rule finalizes with minor changes the proposed requirements that all licensees retain their records until the business or licensed activity is discontinued, either on paper or in electronic format. Oh, that's nice. The ITF director at the business or collection premises readily accessible for inspection. This includes authorizations of licensees to their store. That, all right, includes authorizations of licensees to store their closed out paper records and forms older than 20 years at a separate warehouse, which would be considered part of the business or collection premises for this purpose and subject to inspection. These provisions will enhance public safety by ensuring that the acquisition and disposition of records of all active licensees are not destroyed after 20 years and will rain, remain available for law enforcement for tracing purposes. A summary of costs and benefits. None, sorry. The final rule clarifies which firearms are subject to regulation under the Gun Control Act and NFA and associated licensing, marking, and record keeping requirements. The rule requires people, persons who engage in the business of dealing in weapon and firearm or frame in weapon and frame or receiver parts kits defined as firearms to be licensed Mark the frames or receivers within such kits with serial numbers and other marks of identification and maintain records of their acquisition and disposition. The provisions of these statutes and implementing regulations are designed to increase public safety by, among other things, preventing prohibited persons from acquiring firearms and allowing law enforcement to trace firearms involved in crime. To minimize disruption in cost to the, to minimize disruption, 
pathetic and cost to the licensed firearms industry as much as possible in keeping with public safety goals of the rule. This rule grandfathers existing complete frame or receiver designs previously determined by the director mm -hmm, to be the firearm frame or receiver of a given weapon. It does not grandfather partially complete, disassembled, or non-functional frames or receivers, including weapon or frame or receiver parts kits that ATF did not classify as firearms, frames, or receivers as previously defined. ATF estimates that 7% annualized cost of this rule is $14.3 million. <laughs> The next one is called background. So it's only gonna cost $14 million to do this. Next is background. The attorney general is responsible for enforcing the Gun Control Act of 1968 as amended and the National Firearms Act of 1934 as amended. This responsibility includes the authority to proclamate regulations as necessary. Does that mean just make them up? regulations necessary to enforce the provisions of the Gun Control Act and the NFA. So the Attorney General can do anything they want. I'm not commenting. Though. Congress and the Attorney General have delegated the responsibility for administering and enforcing the Gun Control Act and the NFA to the director of the NFA or the ATF, subject to the direction of the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General. Accordingly, the department and ATF have proclamated regulations to implement the, G the Gun Control Act and the NFA. On May 21, 2021, the department published the federal in the Federal Register a notice of proposed rulemaking, the comment period, entitled Definition of Frame or Receiver and Identification of Firearms proposing changes to various regulations in 27 something blah 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 the comment period for the proposed rule concluded on august 19th 2021 and atf received 290,031 comments the comment period provided a comprehensive explanation of the passage of the firearms fed the provided comprehensive explanation of the passage of the Federal Firearms Act in 1938, its repeal, and the subsequent legislative history and context leading to Congress's passage of the Gun Control Act in 1968, as well as the promulgation of the definitions for frame or receiver that ATF and the firearms industry have relied on for more than 50 years. The Gun Control Act defines the term firearm to include not only a weapon that will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile, but also the frame or receiver of any such weapon. Because frames or receivers are included in the definition of firearm, any person who engages in the business of manufacturing, importing, or dealing in frames or receivers must also re obtain a license from the ATF. Each licensed manufacturer or importer must identify means of a serial number engraved or cast on the receiver or frame of the weapon in such manner as the Attorney General shall, by regulations, prescribe each firearm imported or manufactured by such importer or manufacturer. Licensed manufacturers and importers must also maintain permanent records of production or importation, as well as their receipt, sale, or other disposition of firearms, including frames or receivers. And we're on page 13. The Gun Control Act does not define the terms frame or receiver to implement the statute, but frames or receivers are the primary structural components of a firearm to which the fire control components are attached. After the Gun Control Act was enacted, the terms frame or receiver and frame or receiver were defined as the part of a firearm which provides housing for the hammer, bolt, or breech block, and firing mechanism in which is usually threaded at its forward position to receive the barrel. 
uh, the intent in whatever that word is, these definitions was to inform the public and industry as to which portion of a firearm was the frame or receiver for purposes of licensing, serialization, record keeping, and thus ensuring that a necessary component of the weapon could be traced if later involved in a crime. And now we don't have crime. Sorry, that's not in there anymore. The Comment period discussed that at the time the regulatory definitions were proclamated. Now, where is this already? I love this word. Single framed firearms, such as revolvers and break open shotguns, some of the worst, were far more prevalent for civilian, non military, or law enforcement, in case you didn't know what civilian means, use in the United States than split receiver weapons such as semi-automatic rifles and pistols with the detachable magazines. Single framed firearms incorporate the hammer, bolt, or breech lock and firing mechanism within the same housing. Over time, split receiver Firearms became popular for civilian use. Those are people that aren't in the military or in law enforcement, such as the AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, upper receiver and lower receiver, the Glock semi-automatic pistol, upper slide assembly, and lower grip module, and the Sig Sauer P320 pistol or the M17 as adopted by the US military. That's the more about, anyway, uh, upper side assembly, chassis, and lower grip model. And more firearms manufacturers began, began incorporating a striker fire mechanism rather than a hammer in the firing design, such, such as the Glock pistol. And then there's an illustration of its grip angle here. Uh, as ATF application of the definitions to split frames and receivers. The comment period explained that the ATF's regulatory def... Ow, man, that hurt. The uh, comment period explained that the ATF's regulatory definitions of frame or receiver do not expressly, expressly capture these types of firearms, meaning the split frames or receivers, that now can constitute the majority of firearms in the United States. However, ATF's position has long been that the weapon should be examined with a view towards determining if the upper or lower half of the receiver has near more nearly fits the legal definition of receiver, specifically for machine guns, whether the upper or lower portion has the ability to accept machine gun parts. The comment pistol period listed the variety of factors ATF has considered when making determinations for firearm classifications under the Gun Control Act and NFA regarding which part of the firearm is the frame or receiver, given that neither a split nor a multi-piece receiver has a portion of its design that falls within the precise wording of the existing regulatory definition. Indeed, the current definitions were never intended to be understood. Oh, no, I read that wrong. Indeed, the current definitions were never intended or understood to be exhaustive. The department discussed in the comment period the existing law and congressional intent, recognizing that the definition of frame or receiver need not be limited to a strict application of the regulation. At the time of the current definitions were adopted, there were numerous models of firearms that did not contain a part that fully meant the regulatory definition of frame or receiver, such as the Colt 1911, the FAL, and the AR-15, all of which were originally manufactured almost exclusively for the military use. ATF has long applied factors stated in the comment period when determining which component of the weapon qualifies as the frame or receiver. While ATF for decades has classified the lower receiver of the AR-15 as a frame or receiver, some courts currently have treated the regulatory definition as inflexible when applied to, applied to the lower portion of the AR-15, which is the semi-automatic version of the M-16 machine gun, originally designed for the U.S. military, non-civilians. That was because these courts have read the regulatory definition to mean that the lower portion of the AR-15 is not a frame or receiver as it provides housing only for the hammer and the firing mechanism, not the bolt or breech lock. 
and there's no thready part at the front. Uh, let's see. Now I'm skipping to where it quits a bunch of blob, and then under the GCA, the receiver of a firearm must be a single unit that holds three, not two components, the hammer, the breech, or bolt, and the firing mechanism. Um, oh, United States versus Jimenez, 2016, huh? Anyway, the comment period explained that if broadly followed the court's interpretation of the ATF's regulation could mean that as many as 90% of all firearms now in the United States would not only would not have any frame or receiver subject to regulation under the current definitions. I know that's not the first time I've read that. The firearms would include numerous widely available models such as the Glock and SIG pistols that do not utilize a hammer, a named component in the existing regulatory definition in the firing sequence. Such a narrow interpretation of what constitute a frame or receiver would allow persons to avoid obtaining a license to engage in the business of manufacturing or importing upper or lower frames or receivers, which would further allow these persons to avoid the Gun Control Act's marketing, record keeping, and background check requirements pertaining to upper or lower frames or receivers. In turn, prohibited persons may more easily and without a background check acquire upper and lower receivers that can quickly be assembled into automatic weapons. Semi-automatic weapons. Oh my goodness. Moreover, law enforcement's ability to trace semi-automatic firearms later used in crime would be severely impeded if no portion of a split or multi-piece frame or receiver were subject to any existing regulations as described. This would undermine the intent of Congress in requiring the frame or receiver of every firearm to be identified as regula and regulated as a firearm. Privately made firearms is the next section. The comment period explained that the technological advances have also made it easier for companies to sell firearms parts kits, standalone frames, or receiver parts are partially complete frames or receivers to unlicensed persons, posing significant challenges to the regulation of frames and receivers and enabling prohibited individuals to easily make firearms at home, especially if aided by personally owned equipment or 3D printers. These privately made firearms, commonly referred to as ugh, ghost guns, are not required by the GCA to have a serial number placed on the frame or the receiver when made for personal use. Those personally made firearms are relinquished by their owners, enter commons, commerce, and are later recovered and submitted for tracing. The absence of markings on PMFs makes it extremely difficult for law enforcement to determine where, by whom, or when they were manufactured, and to whom or where they were sold or otherwise disposed. The comment period discussed the substantial increase in the number of PM, oh really, PMFs recovered from crime scenes throughout the country in recent years. From January 2016 through December of 2021, there were approximately 45,000 suspected PMF reported to the ATF has been, as having been recovered by law enforcement from potential crime scenes, including 692 homicides or attempted homicides, not including suicides, in which ATF attempted to trace. Broken down by calendar year, the total annual numbers of suspected personally made firearms recovered to show significant recovered show significant proliferation over the past six years in 2016 there was like barely 1700 of these things 2017 there was 2500 in 2018 almost 4000 can you believe it in 2019 7500 in 2020 10,000, and in 2021, 19,000 of them. I had to gasp for a while. Now I'll keep going. Um, oh, good. There's a stupid chart that just had all stupid numbers and a stupid chart, so you can look at that. Uh, next, 
numerous criminal cases have been brought by the department to counter the illegal trafficking of unserialized, privately com completed and assembled weapons. The possession of such weapons by a prohibited person and other related federal crimes. This is why it's 364 pages. I'm scrolling past like a lot of footnotes or something. I don't know what I'm going past here. This is garbage. This is why somebody is getting an entire career, like they're getting a, a retirement from writing stuff like that. All right, the next one, it, it starts again on page 22. The problem on, on, of untraceable firearms being acquired and used by violent criminals and terrorists is international in scope. The privately made, uh, no, the comment period highlighted Congress's concern based on intelligence reports from the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the National Counterterrorism Center that untraceable firearms pose a challenge to law enforcement's ability to investigate crimes and that widely availability, the wide availability of ghost guns and the emergence of functional 3D printed guns are a homeland security threat. Numerous criminal investigations and studies have demonstrated these concerns, while several states and municipalities had banned or severely restricted unserialized or 3D printed firearms. Really? Man, I want to not com I want to comment because there's like five no not even there's three three anyway next courts have recognized that the information licensees are required to record and maintain under the gun control act enables federal authorities both to enforce the law's verification measures and to trace firearms used in crimes oh goodness uh let's see at least one court has also concluded I'll get as far as I can before I fall asleep. At least one court has also concluded that ATF has a statutory duty to pursuant to the Gun Control Act to trace firearms to keep them out of the hands of criminals and other prohibited persons. This duty includes assisting state and local law enforcement in their efforts to control the traffic of firearms within their borders. Indeed, as of January 2022, there are approximately eight 1,600 law enforcement agencies, including 49 agencies from 46 foreign countries that use E-Trace. Oh, nice. A web-based application administer, administered by the ATF that allows authorized law enforcement agencies to submit and conduct comprehensive traces of recovered crime guns and develop long-term strategies on how to best reduce firearms-related crime firearms trafficking, and violence in their communities. As discussed in the comment period, tracing is an integral tool for the federal, state, and local, uh, federal, state, local, and international law enforcement agencies to utilize in their criminal investigations and the proliferation of untraceable firearms severely underestimates this, under, undermines this process. The comment period described the overall process that the ATF engages in when tracing firearms submitted by law enforcement. The department stressed how ATF relies on the record keeping required to be maintained by licensees in order to locate the first unlicensed person who acquired the recovered firearm from a licensed dealer. This information can help the per per what the, can help the find oh can help find the per, the perpetrator or provide valuable leads that help to solve the crime. Thus, for a successful trace to be conducted, an accurate firearm description is necessary and required to be recorded by a person licensed to engage in the business of manufacturing, importing, or dealing in firearms, or by a licensed collector of curio or relic firearms, regardless if it is a business or a personal firearm of the licensee. Huh. I'm trying not to comment. I'm trying not to comment. Here's me not commenting. Because personally made firearms lack serial numbers and other markings from a licensed manufacturer, 
ATF has found it extremely difficult to successfully complete traces of personally made firearms. Out of the approximately 45,000 submitted traces of personally made firearms mentioned above in the 16 year, they don't want to mention how long that time frame was, but I'm not commenting. ATF could only successfully complete only 445 of those attempted traces uh, to an individually unlicensed purchaser. Successful traces of the personally made firearms have been completed in these rare instances primarily because licensees who acquired the personally made firearms sometimes recorded a serial number that had been voluntarily engraved by the manufacturer on a commercially purchased handgun slide, barrel, or other firearm part but are not required by the Gun Control Act to be marked. That comment period, the department noted that the rapid emergence of personally made firearms in recent years, licensees have sought clarity from the ATF on how personally made firearms may be accepted and recorded. Oh, you know my answer to that. Licensees engaged in the business of dealing in firearms are subject to various rec recording and reporting requirements, including completion of a hmm. including completion of a firearms acquisition and disposition record to record their firearms inventory um sorry uh, a firearms transition transaction record ATF Form 4473 for disposition of a firearm to an unlicensed person, a firearms, an FFL license theft loss report upon discovery of theft or loss of firearms, and a report of multiple sale or disposition of pistols and revolvers, ATF Form 3310-4 to document sales or other dispositions of multiple pistols or revolvers within five consecutive business days to the same person. Wait, does that mean that every FFL has to report any time there's a sale of more than one pistol or revolver to the same person within five business days? Oh, yeah, it's like that for everybody. I'm not commenting, though. These forms require licensees to record the manufacturer and importer, if any, model, if designated, serial number, type, and caliber or gauge of the firearm. As applied to personally made firearms, licensees acquiring them might only record a type of firearm. For example, a pistol or revolver, rifle or shotgun in their records and on the Form 4473s. With such limited information, it will soon become increasingly difficult, if not impossible, for licensees and ATF during inspections to match accurately and reliability the personally made firearms in the inventory uh, with those required recorded and required in the records or to determine whether the personally made firearm recorded and disposed of on 4473s are those recorded and disposed in the records. Likewise, licensees and ATF will have difficulty accurately determining which personally made firearms were stolen or lost from inventory. It will also be difficult for police to locate PMFs in the, I'm going to start calling personally made firearms PMFs now, since it's too much to say, uh, locate stolen PMFs in the business inventories of pawnbrokers, for example, or to return any recovered or stolen lost PMFs to their rightful owners. Couldn't mute that one. Came too fast. Assuming a PMF can, assuming a kit gun, I'm going to call it kit gun, can be successfully traced to a FFL or to a correct 4473 can be located, the comment period explained that the ATF form 4473 is the primary evidence used to prosecute straw purchasers who buy firearms from FFLs typically on behalf of prohibited persons such as felons or illegal firearms traffickers and other persons who could use firearms to commit violent crimes. The form is typically the key evidence that the straw purchase who bought the F firearm and who can pass the background check made a false statement to the FFL concerning the identify identity of the actual purchaser when acquiring that firearm. 
in a violation of the law. But as unmarked and difficult to trace kit guns, I'll be on in a lot already. Uh, but as unmarked and difficult to trace kit guns are transacted throughout the commercial marketplace, law enforcement will have difficulties prosecuting straw purchasers for making false statements because it will be harder to prove that the firearms are acquired under false pretenses on the 4473 were the ones found in the hands of the true purchaser. Likewise, the absence of identifying firearm information on multiple sales forms and theft loss reports makes it difficult for ATF to identify firearms traffickers and thieves. It's really difficult for them. Their, their job is so difficult. Maybe there are none. Uh, next up, I won't comment. C, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on identification markings placed on firearm silencers and mufflers. The comment period noted that on May 4th, 2016, the department published an advance notice on proposed rulemaking in the register. Blah, blah, blah. It was issued in response to a petition filed on behalf of the NFA Trade Collectors Association. Come on, man. Seriously, what's going on here? All right, that shouldn't happen again. Um, this says that it was issued in response to a petition filed. Wait, the comment period was issued in response to a petition filed on behalf of the NFA TCA, the National Firearms Act Trade and Collectors Association. It's an organization out of Texas, if I remember correctly. A trade group representing the firearms and import community. The petitioner requested that the relevant regulations be amended to require that a silencer be marked on the outer tube as opposed to other locations, such as an end cap that might be damaged when a projectile passes through it, unless a variance is granted by the director on a case-by-case -case basis for good cause. ATF found that the petitioner raised valid concerns. Under the GC Gun Control Act, licensed manufacturers and importers must identify the frame or receiver of each firearm, including a firearm muffler or a silencer with a serial number in accordance with regulations. The NFA requires firearm manufacturers, importers, and makers to identify each firearm, including a firearm muffler or silencer with a serial number. I'm just going to say silencer because muffler is a stupid thing to have written in here a hundred thousand times with a serial number and such identification as may be prescribed by regulations. Because the NFA describes each individual part of a silencer as a firearm, that must be registered in the uh, NFA book. The regulations currently assume that every part defined as a silencer must be marked in order to be registered and expressly require that each part be marked whenever sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of, even though it may have been installed by a qualified licensee within a complete muffler, or I mean silencer. The comment period explained that along with industry members, ATF considers the term outer tube to mean the largest external part of a silencer and that, oh, they didn't say muffler. Holy moly, I'm confused. Do they mean just muffler now or just silencer? Oh, I'm scared. Largest external part of a silencer and that portion of a sil Oh, it says silencer by itself again. <sighs> it encapsulates all components of the silencing unit. Nice. And which contains and controls the expansion of the expan escaping gases. <sighs> ATF explained that placing all required markings on the outer tube of a completed firearm silencer is the accepted industry standard. In addition, ATF discussed that requiring identifying marks to be placed on a single part provides consistency of markings throughout the industry and eliminates the need to remark a device in the event an end cap is damaged and requires replacement. ATF believed that a more specific marketing requirement for a silencer such as the outer tube would lead to greater uniformity, improve public safety, and decrease firearms crime. What? What? Including firearms trafficking. <laughs> All right, I'm just reading it, I'm not commenting. 
The comment period was used to solicit comments to determine if an amendment to the regulations that would require placement of identifying marks on the outer tube of the firearm silencers was warranted. In response to the comment period, ATF received 48 comments. A few commenters supported issuance of a proposed rule because they believed it would not violate any constitutional rights under the Second Amendment, would enhance public safety for the reasons ATF stated, and would reduce confusion within the industry without being a financial burden because it's already a standard practice with many manufacturers. <laughs> the majority of commenters, the majority of all 48 commenters, uh, expressed a opposition and did not want ATF to proceed with any further rulemaking. Huh. Specific reasons for their objection to a proposed rule included a belief that, one, the ATF lacks legal authority to specify where markings on silencers must be located and that such a rule would violate the Second Amendment. Two, the initial comment period petition is outdated. And three, there is no data to support that a new rule would enhance public safety or reduce firearms trafficking. <laughs> they had to be told that there's no data to support that a new rule that would enhance public safety or reduce firearms trafficking from having a serial number on the outside of a can. <laughs> and then four, a new regulation is unnecessary as the industry is already complying. Number five, it is not feasible to comply with markings on the outer tube of a silencer with specific designs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, number six, the proposed idea hinders technology, technological advances and future designs. I'm not commenting. Number seven, it would create confusion and definitional problems because the definition of the outer tube is outdated. And eight, the industry and public would incur financial burdens. Other that was eight of the 48 comments, I guess. So, other commenters offered suggestions about outer tube replacement options, especially since silencer tubes wear out over time. They suggested that a rule would be reasonable if ATF authorizes manufacturers to repair or replace damaged silencer tubes and engrave the new tube with the original serial number. Commenters also suggested alternative locations for silencer markings, such as on the end caps. caps. They believe the marking should be placed on the major portion of the silencer, which could be the end cap or any section of the tube. They stress that the outer tube is thin and that there is a greater risk of burning through the metal when engraving and that end caps have greater thickness to work with when engraving. Yeah, no doubt. Beyond on further review and the comments received in response to the comment period, ATF incorporated a proposed definition of frame or receiver as it applies to silencers in the comment period to clarify when and how silencer parts are to be marked and registered. Now we're on section three of this whole thing. It's like page 12 or wait, 32. I can't read it. On May 21, 2021, the department published the Federal Register uh, comment period on the definition of frame or receiver and identification of firearms. Uh, proposing changes to various regulations. Uh, overall, the comment period proposed amending ATF's regulations to clarify the definition of firearm and to provide a more comprehensive definition of frame or receiver so that these terms more accurately re reflect how most modern day firearms are produced and function and so that the courts, firearms industry and the public at large would no longer misinterpret the term to mean that most firearms in circulation have no parts identifiable as a frame or receiver. The common period also proposed new terms such as de and definitions to account for technological developments in modern terminology in the firearms industry as well as proposed amendments to the marking and record keeping requirements that would be necessary to implement these definitions. Definition of a firearm. Let's go. I'm not a biologist, but we're going to try this out. The common period, the department proposed adding a sentence at the end of the definition of firearm to reflect existing case law providing that the term shall include a weapons parts kit that is designed or may be readily assembled, completed, converted, 
or restored to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. Oh, snap. Thank you very much. However, the proposed amendment was not intended to affect the classification of a weapon, including a weapons parts kit in which the frame or receiver, as defined in the proposed rule, of such weapon is properly destroyed. So, I'm not commenting. Therefore, another sentence was proposed to be added at the end of the definition of firearm to provide that the terms, and then quote, the term shall not include a weapon, including a weapons parts kit in which each part defined as a frame or receiver of such weapon is destroyed. Oh my God, that is such political. Somebody got paid to write that sentence right there. So I'm going to keep going without any further comment. The department explained that the comment period fire, wait, wait the, the department explained in the comment period that firearm as defined under the rules includes inoperable weapons, even though they will not expel a projectile by the action of an explosive at the time or at the sale. If they are designed to, or may be readily converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive weapons, parts kits or aggregations of weapon. There's a lot of boilerplate parts some of which contain all the components necessary to complete a functional weapon within a short period of time have been increasingly sold to individuals directly from manufacturers of the kits or the retailers. <coughs> Sorry, I had to cough. Uh, sold to either manufacturers of the kits or the retailers without background checks or record keeping. All right, now I got to yawn. All right, took a break to take a drink there too. All right, so some of these firearms kits include jigs, templates, and tools that allow the purchaser to complete the weapon fairly or reasonably efficiently, quickly, and easily to a functional state. Such weapons parts kits or aggregations of weapons parts that are designed to or readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive are also firearms. I can't even stop these yawns anymore. I'm barely getting to the mute button. Such weapons. Okay. I already said that. Um, the proposed addition makes, ex, makes explicit that manufacturers Position makes explicit that manufacturers and sellers of such kits or aggregations weapon parts are subject to the same regulatory requirements applicable to the manufacturer or sale of fully completed and assembled firearms. The department proposed to revise the definition of frame or receiver with a multi-part definition. The first proposed was a general definition of frame or receiver with non-exclusive examples that illustrated the definition. This was followed by four proposed supplements described below that further explain the meaning of the term frame or receiver for certain firearms designs and configurations, although the proposed definition was intended to more broadly define the term frame or receiver than the current definition, it was not intended to alter or any prior determinations by ATF regarding which specific part of a given weapon it considered the frame or receiver. The common period also proposed to codify the regulations in the regulations, the factors ATF considers when clarify, classifying the frame or receiver of a firearm. So then you get the general definition of frame or receiver. As a threshold matter, the common period proposed that the new definition with partial exception for an internal frame or chassis make clear that each frame or receiver be visual to the exterior when the complete weapon is assembled so that the licensees and law enforcement can quickly and easily identify the markings. Oh my God, I'm not commenting. Next, the, com the common period proposed defining the term or, or de defining the term frame or receiver more broadly as a part that describe 
part that provides housing or a structure designed to hold or integrate any fire control component, which would have included at a minimum any housing or holding, ah, ah, that didn't work, structure, any housing or holding structure for a hammer, bolt, or bolt carrier, breech lock, cylinder, trigger mechanism, firing pin, striker, or side rails. However, the proposed definition would not have been limited to those particular fire control components and was proposed to be general enough to encompass changes in technology and parts terminology for, for, for further clarity. Four non-exclusive examples with illustrations of common single-framed firearms were provided. Uh, finally, the proposed definition stated that persons who may acquire or possess a part are now defined as a frame or a part now defined as a frame or receiver that is identified with a serial number must presume absent or an official determination uh, by the ATF or other reliable evidence to the contrary that a part is a firearm frame or receiver without any further guidance. So Absence an official determination or other reliable evidence, the part is a firearms frame or receiver without further guidance. So if you think it's a receiver, it's a receiver. I'll keep going. Defense definition of a firearms muffler or silencer or frame or receiver. The first proposed supplement to determine define the term frame or receiver as it applies to a firearm or muffler or silencer frame or receiver, to add a new term, complete muffler or silencer device, is further discussed in section D three of this preamble. <sighs> this is still the preamble. The comment period proposed that in the case of a firearm silencer, the frame or receiver is part of the firearm that is visible from the exterior device and provides a housing or structure to design or in hold or integrate one or more of the essential internal components of the device. As described in another section of this preamble, the Gun Control Act's marking requirement and the NFA's definition of a firearm su suppressor, sometimes referred to as a sound suppressor, and its markings requirements have ah, going too fast. Uh, con caused confusion and concern among many silencer manufacturers over the years. The comment period explained that some silencer parts defined as silencers such as baffles are difficult for manufacturers to mark and listed uh, examples of ATF that manufacturers would have difficulty filing and processing in a timely manner. The department also explained that it makes little sense to mark all silencer parts for tracking, for tracing purposes when the outer tube or housing of the complete device is marked and registered. I'm trying to get this thing to scroll for me. For these reasons, the new definitions were proposed to clarify for manufacturers and makers of complete muffler silencers that they do not, that they need only mark one part of the device defined as the frame or receiver under the proposed rule. However, individual silencer parts were proposed to be marked if they are disposed of separately from a complete device unless transferred by a manufacturer qualified under the NFA to, to other qualified licensees for the manufacture or repair of complete devices. Then you get the definition of a split or modular frame or receiver. The second proposed supplement to the general definition sought to capture the majority of firearms that now use a split design as discussed above. It sought to clarify that even though a firearm, including a silencer, may have one or more part that falls within the definition of frame or receiver, the ATF may classify specific part or parts to be the frame or receiver of a particular weapon. It then set forth the various factors ATF would consider in marking or in making this determination with no singer, single factor controlling. It also proposed the clarification that frames or receivers of different weapons that are combined to create a similar weapon each retain their respective classifications as frames or receivers provided they retain their original design and configuration. 
why don't you just ask for people to make parts that are both a frame and a magazine then, you idiots. All right, I'm going to keep going without comment. To ensure that the proposed definition of split or a modular frame or receiver did not affect existing ATF classifications that specified a single component as the frame or receiver, the definition included a non-exclusive list of common weapons with the split or modular frame or receiver configuration for which ATF previously determined a specific part to be the frame or receiver. The comment period explained that a manufacturer or importer of one of these firearms designs as they would exist as of the final rules data publication could refer to this list to know which part is the frame or receiver, thereby allowing the manufacturer or importer to mark a single part without seeking a determination from the ATF. However, there was to be a present or future split or modular design for the firearm that was not comparable to an existing classification, then the proposed definition of frame or receiver would advise absent a variance or classification from the ATF that more than one of the parts is the frame or receiver subject to marking and or other requirements. So if you make anything that's new, everything is a part, every part is a receiver. Just because you haven't seen something that has a receiver, and I'll quit making comments here. Definition of partially complete, disassembled or inoperable frame or receiver. The third supplement proposed to define frame or receiver as including frames or frames that are partially complete, disassembled or inoperable, or a frame or receiver that has reached a stage in manufacturer where it may be readily or completed, assembled, converted or restored to a functional state. The comment period stated that to determine the status, the director may consider any available instructions, guides, templates, jigs, equipment, tools, marketing materials, what? partially complete for purposes of the definition were proposed to mean a forging, casting, printing, extrusion, machined body, or similar article at a stage in manufacture where it is clearly identifiable as an unfinished component of a part of a weapon. The comment period explained that this is a supplemental definition aimed to address when an object becomes a frame or receiver such that it is a regulated article. The comment period stated that a particularly partially complete or unassembled frames of receivers, commonly called 80% receivers, are often sold in kits where the frame or receiver can readily be completed or assembled into a functional state. The department stated that the supplemental definition is necessary for clarity because the companies are not running around or not running background checks or maintaining transaction records when they manufacture and sell these kits. Accordingly, prohibited persons have easily obtained them and, when recovered, are nearly impossible to trace. <gasps> the proposed definition also sought to make clear that uninformed blocks or unformed blocks of metal or other similar articles only in a pre primordial state would not without more processing be considered a partially complete frame or receiver that is captured under the definition of frame or receiver. The definition of destroyed frame or receiver. The fourth supplement proposed to exclude from the definition of frame or receiver any frame or receiver that has been destroyed. This proposed definition described a destroyed frame or receiver as one permanently altered to not provide housing or structure that may hold or integrate any fire control or essential integral or in central internal component, and that may not readily be assembled, completed, converted, or restored to a functional state. The proposed definition set forth non-exclusive acceptable methods of destruction, which had been provided by the ATF in its past guidance. Uh, the definition now of readily, the department proposed to add the term readily uh, as it defines a process that is fairly or reasonably efficient, quick, and easy, but not necessarily the most efficient, speedy, or easy process. <laughs> it further listed factors relevant in applying this proposed definition, such as time, ease, expertise, equipment, availability, expense, scope, and feasibility, with brief examples describing these factors. The proposed definitions and factors are based on case law, interpreting may readily be in, wait, 
interpreting may readily be converted to expel a projectile and can readily be restored to shoot. The common period explained that defining the term readily was necessary to determine when a weapon, including a weapon parts kits and a partially complete or damaged frame or receiver, or an aggression of wep or aggregation of weapon parts becomes a firearm regulated under the control the gun control act and the NFA. Definition and then next up is definitions of complete weapon and complete muffler or silencer device. The, de the department proposed to add the terms complete weapon and complete muffler or silencer device to the proposed definitions of a complete weapon was a firearm. Whether or not assembled or operable, containing all component parts necessary to function as designed, but not a firearm muffler or silencer device. The proposed definition of a complete muffler or silencer device was a firearm muffler or silencer, whether or not assembled or operable, containing all the component parts necessary to function as designed. These terms were proposed to explain when a frame or receiver of a firearm, including a firearms muffler, as the case may be, must be marked for identification. Next, E, definition of a privately made firearm. The, the comment period proposed adding the term privately made firearm. And to define it as a firearm, including a frame or receiver assembled by a person other than a licensed manufacturer and not containing a serial number or identifying, identifying marking placed, on a license, placed by a licensed manufacturer at the time the firearm was produced. The term would not include a firearm identified and registered in the comment period pursuant to any firearm made before October 22, 1968, unless remanufactured after that date. So everything before the 68 Gun Control Act. All right, it looks like we're on page, well, that was page 42. Next is definition of importers or manufacturer serial number. The department proposed to add the term importers or manufacturer serial number and to define it as the identification number, licensee name, licensee city or state, or licensee number placed by a licensee on a firearm or a receiver or a privately made firearm. The comment period explained that the serial number incorporated the abbreviation, uh, oh wait, the serial number incorporating the abbreviated FFL number known in the industry as the RDS key, uh, placed by a licensee, licensee on a personally kit gun under the proposed rule met the definition of the importer's or manufacturer's serial number. The department also explained that the proposed definition would help ensure the serial numbers and other markings necessary to ensure tracing are considered the importer's or manufacturer's serial number and numerous state laws which prohibit possession of firearms with serial numbers which have been removed or obliterated or altered. Well, there's five. It's five numerous, not even five. So I'll quit doing that and keep, keep reading. Definition of a gunsmith. The department proposed to amend the definition of engaged in the business as it applies to gunsmith to clarify that businesses may be licensed as dealer gunsmiths rather than manufacturers if they routinely repair or customize existing firearms, make or fit special barrels, stocks, or trigger mechanisms, or mark firearms as service performed on firearms not for sale or distribution by a licensee. Oh, or mark firearms. So they're saying all of that stuff as a service performed by firearms for sale or distribution. All right. The proposed amendment was also for the purpose of providing greater access to professional marking services. So the persons who engage in the business of identifying firearms for the non licensees may become licensed as gun dealer gunsmiths solely to provide professional marking services. And then you got marking requirements for firearms include uh, information required to be marked on the frame or receiver to properly implement the new definitions the department proposed to amend another rule to explain how and when markings must be applied on each part defined as a frame or receiver, particularly since there could have been more than one part of a complete weapon or complete muffler uh, or silencer, which is the frame or receiver 
with ATF has not identified specific parts as the frame or receiver. Uh, under this comment period, each frame or receiver of a new firearm or design configuration may happen. Oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button, I guess. Open it again. What did I, if I hit back. Uh, to properly implement, the uh, department proposed to amend to how and when markings must be applied on each part, frame or receiver, particularly since there can have been more than one part of a complete weapon or complete silencer, which is the frame or receiver. Under the common period, each frame of the new firearms design was proposed to be marked with a serial number and either the manufacturer's or importer's name and city or state where the manufacturer or importer maintains their place of business or in case of the NFA where the firearm was made or recognized abbreviation and the serial number beginning with the licensee's abbreviated frail FFL number as a prefix, which is the first three and last five did, oh my goodness. <laughs> and then followed by a number, oh my goodness. Followed by a hyphen and then followed by a number, which incorporate letters and hyphens, such as blah, 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 number. Nice. The serial number without, with or without the FFL prefix, identify on each part of the weapon identified, no, weapon defined as a frame or receiver was proposed to be the same number, but could not duplicate any serial numbers placed on the licensee by any firearm. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying not to comment. The... Uh, Comment period proposed that licensed manufacturers and importers could continue to identify the additional information on firearms other than personally made firearms of the same design and configuration as they existed before the effective date of the final rule under the prior content rules and that any rules were necessary to ensure such identification would have to be remained effective for that purpose. This proposed provision was intended to make the transition easier and to reduce production costs incurred by licensees, except for silencer parts transferred by manufacturers to other qualified manufacturers and dealers for completion or repair of devices. No change was proposed to the existing requirement that each part defined as a machine gun or silencer that is disposed of separately and not part of a complete weapon or device will be marked with all required information because individual machine gun conversion and silencer parts are firearms under the NFA that must be registered in the comment period or must be registered. However, for frames and receivers and individual machine gun conversions or silencer parts designed as firearms or defined as firearms that are disposed of separately, the proposed rule that allowed the model designation and caliber or gauge to be admitted if it's unknown at the time the part is identified. The size and depth of markings. I'm telling you what, though, I don't think I can go much further. I am literally falling asleep here, so we're about a 90 minutes in. Let me see where I'm at with this whole thing. If I zoom out a little bit. Period of time. I, I wish I was closer to a big segment or section or something, but I think I'm going to have to cut it off because I'm. I feel like I'm going to start just slurring and sleeping as I'm talking here. So I think I'm going to go with uh, page 45 because 45 stopped World War II and the power of the 45, the decent calibers, uh, can and will save us from this one as well. So we're going to stop at the um, page 45 and uh, depending on, on feedback, I'll continue reading. 360 something more pages, 320 something more pages. I don't think I'm even out of the preamble here, but this gives us a pretty good idea. I've read some of the, or I've already uh, found some interesting things from what we've read so far. So thanks to the people that showed up. Thanks much to the $10 super chat that uh, definitely makes it possible to continue to do things like this. Uh, those things add up, so much appreciated. And uh, uh, we'll throw a plug out here to the patrons and make it possible for me to decide to take some time to do this. I should have been working on some other things, but I uh, uh, figured it would be worth reading this uh, for folks that aren't able or interested in, uh, you know, sitting here and reading this for 90 minutes. So if you were able to get something from this, 
on the way to work, on the way to the range or something like that, then uh, consider having a conversation about it, letting people know that uh, it's not a time to observe, but instead a time to act. Uh, calling Congress people, letting them know. Um, again, having conversations. It's not just about the politicians. The politicians are the end result or one of the pieces in the puzzle, but really it's getting the awareness and uh, the word out. So again, thanks for the people that showed up. Kind of an impromptu middle of the night reading of the, I'll go back up to the top here, Department of, well, the ATF, uh, redefinition of frame or receiver, um, PDF. It's uh, 364 pages long. There's a link to it in the uh, description of the video, wherever you happen to find it. Thanks again. Hey, did you know that you could help support our future projects and let everyone know you're a fan of what we do? Check out our print-on-demand store. We have a tab here on YouTube. When you click on it, you can choose from a bunch of different items we have, shirts and posters and coffee mugs. Click on the one you like. When you find the design you want to put on it, choose a color and a size if it's appropriate. And when you purchase these items, a portion goes to help fund our future projects. We really do appreciate your support. You get some cool stuff. When you get that stuff, post pictures here and on other platforms, and we'll hook you up next time you order from our gear website store. Thank you for your support of gunwebsites.com. So let us know what you think. We'll be watching the comments wherever you find the video over on gunstreamer.com or on guntube.org. Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The, the guys and gals of gunwebsites.com encourages you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching gunwebsites.com.